Hi, I'm Tane. And I'm Aid, and this is Alter Call, a Married at First Sight podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We finally made it to the reunion. Um, hi, Aid. Hi, Tane. We're recording right after the episode, and I'm exhausted. I don't know what I just watched, but we're going to get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. Please share with the people the updates that we have for them this week. <laughs> I hope you guys, um, we are working on our audio situation. I actually got a new microphone um, after a couple of weeks of just mishaps. When it came to recording, so here's to hoping that we sound better, that we're loud enough. We we are always working on our audio. I can promise you that. And so is every other podcaster based on what I hear. (laughs) (laughs) We're trying, guys. I promise. (laughs) Um, um, On Patreon, we have 90 Day Fiance, the first four episodes posted this week. Um, Yeah, I love 90 Day Fiance. Tane, Tane loves it in her heart. (laughs) <laughs> i love you by proxy to aid yes <laughs> uh next week we will be off um so we will have a patreon bonus episode posted it will be the most recent season love is blind the first batch of episodes the first episode we did on the season so enjoy that and then we are covering the reunion part two it'll just be uh late uh so lo- Watch out for that um, the week after. So, Tane, what's happening with the previous maths people? All right. I feel like I have old news, but I just feel like maybe I never said it or I didn't remember. But Nate from San Diego has a new girlfriend. Again, can't remember if I said that, but yeah, they're going strong. I'm recognizing it as news. I don't think I've heard it before, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Yeah, she Nate. pops up every now and then. And that goes for Zach, too, from the Houston um, season. He also has a girlfriend. That's been a while. That's been a while, yes. though, right? Yeah. yeah, I just can't remember if I ever said it. And then it's like, I see the picture. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to remember. I need to say that. But yeah. Um, Emily posted something, Decision Day, one year ago, April 7, 2023. And it just feels like it's longer than it should have been. I don't think I thought it was that long ago. Um, Let's do, I'm trying to do some math. Okay. So they got married in early January. So eight weeks would have put them at like March. And so shooting the reunion in April seems a little bit early. But for Michael and Chloe, if they had a full eight weeks and they got married in February, I don't understand how this, oh, you said decision day. Sorry. I was yes, thinking. I was about to say, yeah. Like I no, went they, on the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> they filmed, thanks to Maps fan, they filmed the reunion December. Okay. Well, which that's is a still a long time. Jan- Mid January, which we know they got married in January. April seventh is not eight weeks from any time in January. Mm. Even if you did January thirty first, that's still not eight weeks. But okay, Th- that's a weird timeline. But okay. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, something that's not news, but um, we posted this on our social media. I just don't think I said it here. Is that Jessica and Austin from DC are expecting their second kid. And honestly, their son Weston is the cutest thing. <laughs> I'm such a big fan of Jessica and Austin. I hope they come back for one of these like things. Yeah, they're just living their best life, unproblematic, just sitting there and doing their thing. So congratulations to them. Um, And finally, Eric from the Atlanta season shared that he and his wife are going through the process of IVF um, to have a kid. Good for them. I hope that it gives them everything they would want. Yes, agreed. And that's pretty much all I have. Nothing much happening this week. Um, Tane, I was sort of depending on you to deliver mm-hmm. some news. So I saw that Jamie did a gender reveal. Yeah. But she's like drip dripping it. So one twin is a boy and the other one we had to wait. So do we know the gender of the other twin? 
Girl, I tried. Every time I went on there for a find out on YouTube, oh, our subscribers are going to, I was like, I don't have time for this. We're going to find out anyway. So no, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I do not have the patience. Like, I'm so happy for her. And I feel like her content has strictly been about the kids now and i just i yeah i don't know what it is as long as they're healthy congratulations to her but i think the last thing i saw i was trying to look through it again and it was this really long caption and she was like no i conceived my twins um naturally i didn't do anything these are the things i did i'm taking this supplement and i stopped drinking caffeine and i was like but what is the gender but so i don't know <laughs> I just pulled a Jamie with a long answer, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I just, I'm amazed by this social media. How are you going to be like gender reveal and then only half gender reveal? Cause you know, you can get more content out of a second gender reveal. The chutzpah. You might as well. I mean, continue the process when she had the news, it was like DM for the link DM for the thing. And then people just come in the comments and it was like, she's pregnant. She's pregnant. And then she's like DM for the other surprise. And they're like, it's multiples. I'm like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out by the, by the next episode. I, uh, we should know by then. So maybe I'll take that trick to YouTube. It's on YouTube. So. I like how I was like, oh, I'm not going to go to YouTube, Tainan. <laughs> That's a special kind of evil. I know, but you know what? You're right. You're right. It's expected because I think one of the times I listen to a podcast for something for them. So it's not, you're on the right path. I just wasn't in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we don't have to go. Come on, the audience. Help us out. Let us know the gender of Jamie's twins. I'm sorry, Jamie and Doug's twins. Yes. Um, oh, all right, guys. We will be right back to talk about this lovely episode. Life doesn't happen bi weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earn In. Earn In is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earn In app and verify your paycheck. Then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. Whether it's a special gift for a loved one or needing help early with rent this month, make Earn In a part of your financial routine and join Earn In's over 3.5 million customers who say things like, when I think about Earn In, I think about financial stability and security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earn In today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, -N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earn In app, type in AltaCall on the podcast. When you sign up, it'll really help the show. That's AltaCall on the podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max, see earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. If you're like me and looking to cut back on alcohol this year, Recess Zero Proof Craft Mocktails are the perfect alcohol replacement. They've recreated the cocktails you know and love, like a lime margarita and a grapefruit paloma, which happens to be my favorite, so you can enjoy the flavors and feelings of those cocktails without the booze. Zero proof, zero compromise. Listeners can get 15% off the Recess Mocktail Sampler at takearecess.com slash altocallmafs. Each can of Recess is a lightly sparkling mocktail made with real fruit and only 25 calories or less. It's a guilt-free way to unwind. They taste just like your favorite cocktails without the alcohol. Whether you're relaxing after work or hanging out with friends, make recess mocktails your drink between drinks or your forever mocktail. Get 15% off recess mocktails now at takearecess.com slash altercallmafs. That's A-L-T-A-R-C-A-L-L-M-A-F-S. So you can enjoy your favorite cocktails without the consequences. Whether you're going through menopause, perimenopause, or just hate that vicious week before your period when you have those terrible cravings and can't seem to find comfort in your body, then you have to try Hormone Harmony. Happy Mammoth, the company that created Hormone Harmony, is dedicated to making women's lives easier by helping you maintain optimal hormone levels. 
That means using only science-backed ingredients that have been proven to work for women. They make no compromise when it comes to quality, and it shows. Hormone Harmony contains herbal extracts called adaptogens that help the body adapt to any stressors, which includes chaotic hormonal changes that happen naturally throughout a woman's life. With over 17,000 reviews, join the women who keep mentioning how the biggest benefit of taking Hormone Harmony is feeling like themselves again. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com by using the code AUTOCALLMAFS at checkout. That's A-L-T-A-R-C-A-L-L-M-A-F-S. And we're back to reunion part one. I was looking forward to this. I, w- I was a... <laughs> You know, you guys, I can get really excitable real easy, and I'm really going to try to hold it in because I'm annoyed. I'm, uh, you know, I did a little bit of live tweeting. I was cussing all over the place because I, I, I can't believe what I'm watching. Like, this is just from the get go. But I will say this there's no love, there's no romance or whatever. But in a way, it's kind of entertaining, it's just not fulfilling. There's and nobody I, on that stage who is in love with each other and happily married. And the show is called Married at First Sight. And so that is a big element that's missing from the shit show. Yeah, but when I say fulfilling, there are no answers. Mm-hmm. It's just a he said, she said, he said, like, fine. I made peace with the fact that we probably wouldn't get answers. And we know that they hate each other. But it's such a roller coaster. Do you hate each other? Do you not? I don't. It's It's weird. But we might as well get into this because I really think this is going to be a long one. <laughs> it's going to be a long one, folks. Buckle up. <laughs> First, before we even get started, there's a preview with all the most dramatic moments that we're about to see. And I was like, okay, let's go. So... At first, I was disappointed because we started with every, you know, we got Kevin saying hello, welcome to the re- the reunion. And then everybody is seated around him. And I don't know, I just watched the Potomac reunion and... I enjoy it when they like show us people sitting down, but they showed us plenty of that in the rest of the episode, but they didn't show it in the beginning. So the seating chart is as such. We got the girls plus Orion on one side and the guys plus Chloe on the other side, basically to accommodate the fact that the girl, most of the men don't want to sit with the women, but Chloe and Michael are fine with sitting next to each other. And so to accommodate that, they have this very strange seating chart. The girls are all in pink and Chloe is in purple. Noted. (laughs) Speaking of the looks, did Orion and Cameron know they were coming to a reunion? It wasn't their best foot forward. Uh, uh, Cameron has a hoodie with a jacket. What? And Orion just looked as casual as can be. And I'm not, you know, Austin, I should throw Austin in there. You should. I should throw Austin in there. Because I was at a denim jacket or what? I Like, effort. Like, I said the same thing last week at the Couples Tell All about Jamie. Which, on second thought, eight. I saw the dress afterwards. It's not as bad as I remembered it. But I still stand by what I said. I just feel like when you have events like this, just a little effort goes a long way. That's just how I feel about it. And this was just kind of like insulting it was insulting but i feel like a context matters they live in denver like if they were in atlanta or i mean even the san diego guys worked much harder on their looks than this schlubs um i'm, I'm sorry just- the women live in denver too no michael lives in Denver. okay he's a transplant brennan lives in denver like i'm not no there's no excuse for this everybody knows you dress up for an event Actually, Michael was very dressed up. I didn't really understand his pants, especially from sitting down, but they were a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. So Kevin asks how everybody is. He tells everybody they look good. Emily says she's excited. Um, So Kevin, of course, pivots like, Brennan, how are you? And he asks how often the girls talk and the girls say that they talk every day, all day, and that they live near each other. Then he asks how much the guys talk. And Orion's like, we have a group chat, but there's not much there. Um, is everybody going this weekend? That type of thing. I'm like, going this weekend to where? To this reunion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Austin says that they don't talk that much, but he does. Um, I think he, I forget who Austin said he's besties with. 
Michael. Michael. There we go. Lauren also asked, like, well, what happened to all of you being best friends? And I was like, never did these men claim to be best friends. I have no recollection of that. I'm surprised Cameron and Brennan are besties. <laughs> but it was funny the way Michael said it, because Austin was like, no, because Orion was like, oh, we have a group chat. There's not much, but we kind of talk. No, Orion actually said they, they kind of talk. And Austin is like, I think that's not true. <laughs> we don't really talk. <laughs> I only talk to him. Uh, we don't really talk in there. And Michael is like, how dare you? How can you say that? And then he's like, well, except for Michael. So we know Orion just be lying as a hobby. So Kevin, Kevin asked Cam if he's doing all right, you know, in light of his health issues. And he says he's fine. Uh, Kevin did ask him if he rode his bike and he said he did a couple times this summer. And I was actually really happy to say, hear that. He asked how Emily is and she says it's her first day without a cast. You guys, I feel like this was some type of mystery and maybe it shouldn't have been. So she was injured from the accident, ATV accident from her wrist and they just didn't really talk about it during the show. It was all about her head, her head, her head. So that was a bit confusing. Um, I don't know. I think it was just kind of inferred since she already mentioned it, like her wrist and then maybe like from after party. So it's just kind of like, Oh, it's from the accident. So, um, she looks great and she thanks the plastic surgery and Botox for her head situation being good. Kevin asks about the pink dresses. Becca says that it's us standing strong in female power. And Lauren says it's about knowing more than we are just characters on a screen and they find power in solidarity and wearing pink. Tane, what do you think about that? I don't know if I should answer this question. I just, I don't know. I just, I get where they're coming from, but I think through the whole after party, through the whole, you know, the way everything has gone down and being so contentious, Chloe not being part of it, it just seems kind of redundant and a little silly. Like wearing pink when we don't know what it is until now doesn't really do anything like you can reclaim your power in other ways i think so i don't know it it didn't like i'm again i didn't live their experience so it probably means something to them but i i just think there are other ways that they could have done it i promise these girls that if they had been wearing colors of different dresses i still would have known that they stand in solidarity with each other yeah i'm glad we also get to ask chloe why she's not wearing pink chloe is a diplomat to the core (laughs) because she says the other ladies formed a bond and you know the timeline and me coming in late they look beautiful (laughs) she's also like and i'm not joining them in their in their thing no not for me she still left that part unsaid it was implied (laughs) so kevin says that since the cameras have gone away they have heard and i assume they being the producers everybody that this has been the most contentious cast of maths He's like, we've never had a season where the spouses couldn't sit together at the reunion. And I was like, Chloe and Michael, the forgotten couple. He (laughs) says, what's going on? And Becca starts it. She said there was a lot that happened on camera, more so off camera, optics, optics. For the ladies in pink, it was difficult for us because optics are still part of the picture. There's not a trust to move forward. Kevin calling a spade a spade is like, there seems to be a lot of tension. Why? Um, I really wanted to understand. Okay. Chloe and Michael are clearly not part of this tension. And I'm not sure that Lauren and Orion are on the part of the tension on the same level at this point. Mm -hmm. But as we go on, yes, it appears Lauren and Orion, despite the fact they can sit on the same side of the room, they can't sit next to each other. And the hatred is just as strong. Mm Mm-hmm. Emily says there seems to be some unresolved things. It's hard to sit here with people who ran away from accountability and it's uncomfortable. I can't remember if she was asked or she decided to volunteer who ran away. She said Brennan and Cam. And Cam's like, how did I run away? And Emily says, after your marriage, you pulled her aside and said you weren't attracted to her. At this point, I am very, very, very annoyed. Mm -hmm. Y'all are not a team. Let's say that Cam did do that. I promise, Emily, you weren't there. 
why are you telling Claire's story? Why isn't Claire saying, it's okay, I can tell my own story? What? what why? Yeah, that's the I problem. I was not looking forward to two hours of this. Yeah, Emily should not be speaking on someone else's marriage. It's not a we versus he versus she versus it's a couple situation. Just let it be. And they've been speaking all after party at the reunion. Just let it be. So Kevin, look, Kevin's a good host. And I want to give props to Kevin because I feel like he did the best job that could be done this evening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Kevin says, Cam, did you say that? And he says, no. And then the pink chorus says, yes. And I'm like, but only one of you was there. Mm -hmm. And then Lauren says, there are liars and there are truth tellers. And that's why there's tension. And Becca's like, we've been lied to. Us four girls, you know, it's very difficult. Nothing is going to be resolved with all of us sitting there. And then they start talking about, uh, well, Emily does, starts talking about deleted diary cams and a sense of silencing and lying. Kevin asked Brennan, did you want to deceive this process by deleting things? And he said, no, we live private lives. Kevin's like, but you're going to be on TV. So, yeah. Brennan says there are things we talked about on camera and then other things, not so much. Um, they did talk about how they were, were not going to give producers control and that they were, their goal was to get through this in the best way possible. So they came up with a plan for everybody to look great, not just the guys. So Becca is like, why? I'm sitting there thinking, so Brennan's saying that all of you, all eight of you got together and made up a plan and none of you girls in pink is disagreeing with what he's saying. <laughs> The only part you're disagreeing with is the method, but you all agree that you guys got together and made some type of plan. Yeah. And Becca is like, well, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we wanted to have a good marriage and that's why we, um, that she also said that some people wanted to look good on Instagram and build businesses and it was a game of survivor. So Kevin once asked everybody like, who's he, who came from marriage before he can even, anybody can answer. Lauren's like, everyone will raise their hands and they'll, and something about Orion will be lying if he raises his hands. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this with all of them coming up with a plan or whatever, which is, which explains a lot of why this season was a shit show. Do the producers have a part to play in this? In what sense? That they should tell people to not come up with plans? That they should like be like, guys, cut it out? What do you mean? How could they not tell that there was something being hidden from them? Like in all like some of the producer podcasts that I've listened to, like reality show producers, part of your job is to know your talent. You should be able to draw stories out of them. Like that's how you create like, you know, the flow of the storyline. Not like it's fake completely but the flow of storyline like can't you tell like don't they have producer meetings and they just be like guys if you're doing xyz you need to quit it just be yourself and just get to a point where they trust you enough where, well becca and austin no they didn't trust the producer but get to a point where they trust you so you can get the storyline and also all these things that are coming out where it seems like the producers played into it and also edited it to fit into Whatever narrative was being spoken to, well, that's my answer clearly. But I just wanted to know what you thought because I think they have a they have blame to share in this. They have blame. I agree with you. I didn't think of it that way, but I agree with you that if this is your show and you're producing it and you can see you're being hoodwinked, you should be telling people to cut it out. The other side is maybe they did tell them and they're like, no, we're going to stand strong in our nonsense. And it wasn't consistent nonsense over the eight weeks. There were definitely breakages. That's, you know, the more I think about it, that's insane. I think this was the point where I was like, F this entire cast, because I'm just like, for all the, the eight people to sit and decide like, oh, we're going to come up with a plan. Like the show is doomed from that point. Correct. It kind of reminded me of um, what Rachel said last week where she's like, yeah, the girls came up with a plan and like immediately one of us broke and the plan went out the window very quickly. And I wish she would have described more intensely, like how the producers confronted them, not in like a bad way, but just in a way of like, no, we're not going to do that. Like, be honest. Yeah, because I think the producer sussed it out and is like, so I heard you guys were doing that. It's like, oh, who did this? You kind of have to be a little shrewd about it and just, you know, draw it out. But like you said, maybe they were just team strong. They were united on that front. (laughs) (laughs) 
So Kevin asks Orion, did he come here to be married? And he says he did. Lauren says she doesn't believe it. Then Lauren answers for him and says that he told her on day two that he came in to highlight his um, community and highlight the indigenous community. Like marriage is good, but I'm just here for my culture. Lauren is like, I was a consolation prize. Orion says, yeah, I never had a platform like this and it was exciting to me. And it's exciting that it would be our story at the end. I was like, okay, well, that's not great, Orion. But I also see how that could be completely misconstrued. I see how it could be completely misconstrued. But to me, it means that she's telling the truth. That, you know, this would be a nice adventure. If I get a wife out of it, that would be great. (laughs) So she's not wrong. He also said last week that day two was when he decided he didn't want to be married to her. So, yeah. I think that's what he was like. Oh, I don't really want to be. Well, he said, she says he never told her. Anyway, <laughs> Austin says he came to be married. He, was, he wasn't here for TV or social media. He doesn't care about that stuff. And Becca's like, is that why you plugged in the cameras to have a conversation about optics with me? This one made no sense to me. So <laughs> either he plugged in the cameras because he didn't know what the conversation would be. Or he plugged in the cameras knowing what the conversation would be that you were going to accuse him of optics. I just didn't quite see how there was a benefit to him to have that conversation recorded. I think you said something about this last week. And then I was like, maybe they forgot the cameras were there. And now she's saying he actually deliberately plugged it in to have the conversation. (laughs) But it's par for chorus aid. Like we're all half the time this season, we're trying to make sense of a lot of things and it's exhausting. It is. And Kevin is not having it. Kevin gives him a nice old lecture. He's like, you guys plotted and you screwed up the experiment. These experts go through all this to try to match you with the perfect person. It happens. And then you try to outsmart it. And it's all about seeing you guys go through an authentic experience. And no one got to see that this season because of what you guys did. Emily says that Cameron was the initiator of the plot. Ladies in pink, this is not a strong argument for you. <laughs> Lauren says that she knows it's the truth because Cameron took her aside to work on the plot during the honeymoon. And I actually believe this. I believe there was a group plot. Yeah. I think the idea that Cameron is the ringleader of the plot is not out of this world, but once again, you all went along for it. Yeah. I think that's the where is the accountability? I mean, I think that kind of comes on later, but at this point in time, it was kind of like you guys at any point, you could have just been like, no. But it seemed like a well thought out plan that everyone was on board with until they started doing it the wrong way, I guess. Claire says that Cam created it and he was the puppet master, but she slips up and she said she was the puppet master. And then <laughs> he, Cam is like, that's a Freudian slip. And then Cameron said, this is his first experience being gaslit. God, take me out now. Um. He then kind of mocks Claire and he's like, Claire said, please take the lead, Cameron. I don't know how to do this on my own. And Claire says she was being manipulated. Um, then they said that the their wedding night, they had a lengthy conversation. Then the second night, things took a bad turn. He says that the second night of the honeymoon, after crying that she was in love with her boyfriend, and he says he says boyfriend because he believed that the relationship was current at the time. And he said it was his understanding that she was fucking someone else. That's a quote. (laughs) Despite the fact that Kevin is facing forward for the most part, this man somehow does like a swivel. He just Ah! spins his feet like, ah, what did I just hear? That's so funny. I have a note on that, that the swivel was so hilarious. But let me tell you, Aid, the way everyone's face was when he said that makes me believe that it's true. (laughs) You know, that's funny. I... (laughs) If it is true, then the things that Cameron says later make absolutely no sense. Oh, that again, par for course. Nothing they're doing. When you think you've found like a loose end that you've tied, they're just going to do something else. And you're like, huh? This doesn't make sense. Now, let me clarify. I don't think she had a boyfriend. I think maybe there was someone that she slept with close to the experiment that she maybe had feelings for or unresolved. But one thing this cast knows how to do is conflate a lot of things. 
and exaggerate a lot of things. So him saying the boyfriend thing and everything is like for shock value. And I think Claire's face was more like, I can't believe this motherfucker just shared what I told him in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, and I think that somebody said it, I don't know, one of the guys or whatever in one of the snippets was like, you take a, a granule of something that's true, and then they spin it into something, and that goes for both sides, mm-hmm. and I think that's what the situation is, so I think there was some conversation that was had, I don't think it was a boyfriend and all that stuff, but... Yeah, but it was just funny to me the way everyone reacted. Because honestly, at this point, do we care if it's true or not? We don't know. We're never going to know. So we're just along for the ride. <laughs> so in the world, according to Claire, they the second night, they had this conversation. Cameron was talking about how none of the guys what the, got what they wanted. She specifically named him saying Brennan and um, Austin, which is interesting. Um. He said that he told Pastor Cal he wanted tall and slender, and she admits that she puts two and two together, and she was like, oh, then he's not attracted to me. So she put two and two together. Okay. So Claire says that she was attracted. She was very attracted. At the wedding, she was giddy. You can believe what you want. And all I can think is the night of the wedding when he was trying to help her with her dress. I don't know, girl. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I buy that you were always attracted to Cameron, but Okay. You know, um, I'm a, I'm a bell, I'm a barf because I have to use this word, but we, the audience, we are being gaslit because I'm at a point where I'm questioning things I know for a fact I watched with my eyes on the screen. I cannot remember. I'm like, we saw this woman literally recoil from this man. She said, mm, not quite sure, or whatever, and she's like, no, I've always, always been attracted to him, and I'm like, am I crazy? Is it me, Jesus? I don't know what is happening right now. That's how confused I am by everything that's happening. So Cam says Claire wasn't attracted and she was scared of optics. And Becca jumps in and says, oh, that's what he did to her. They made up the religion thing. So then we talk about how they made up the religion thing. They never cared about religion. Okay. So Kevin is just getting hyphy. He's like, so this was never authentic. And they all agree on that. Um, Claire calls it the saddest part, and Cameron says he went along with it, and Claire is like, you drove me away, and then you self-sabotaged. I actually 100% believe that these two people were talking past each other when it came to attraction. Um. <laughs> the, well, well, okay. Now it feels like a third show, but is this not the best part to bring up the after-party comments that she only likes black guys and something, something? Well, the butt one kind of came up, but I mean, just help us. Help us. There's so much stuff. We're being breadcrumbed here and nothing makes sense. But I thought this would have been the best part, but that didn't come up. Because we've been at it for quite some time at this point and neither one of them have had anything to contribute to this shit show. Kevin looks at Michael and says, well, what do you think? (laughs) And Michael... (laughs) Worst salad guy. (laughs) He's like, basically, it's not fun to watch these people fight. And like me and Chloe are over, but we don't hate each other like these people. Um... And he would hope that she would never hate him that way. Now imagine Michael saying it. He said it much better (laughs) than he did. And I I just want to say, I just feel like there wasn't enough, is the word shame, given Mm -hmm. to them for this planning thing. Because I personally felt offended. It's just like, oh, oh, bring up the religion thing. Oh, I don't care how the kids are raised. You can say anything. And I'm like, this is really, really like insulting, not just to the producers, the experts or anybody, but to those of us who devote our time to watch the show because we actually love the show and we've been watching it. And I just don't think there was enough scolding. Let me put it that way on this. I, I think I, I will agree with you that there was not enough scolding. If given my opportunity, I will do some scolding, but I will give Kevin that he spoke on behalf of the audience pretty well in his scolding. Yeah. Um, Maybe so there's can, more when the experts join or something. Oh, I think there will be lots more scolding there. I think Dr. Pepper <laughs> is ready. Um, so Kevin calls Becca and, uh, on her and Austin and whatever they were doing to plan and plot. And she says she doesn't, she didn't know what was real because they were just like basically plotting so much. She wishes she hadn't gone along with it, but she wanted to make her marriage work. And 
um, Kevin's like, so Austin, did you lead your wife? And he said, I didn't think of it as leading. I thought we were a team. Like we both agreed. We don't, we would just do what we were comfortable with, but he wanted a wife. And Becca's like, you wanted like me as your wife. And he's like, (laughs) and then Kevin asks, Oh, was he ever attracted? He's like, yes, I was. I mean, he's like, I'm not right now. (laughs) 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 But I was. And that's why we ended this first segment. It was a wild ride, y'all. Yeah. Contentious from the beginning. All right. We'll be back for more yelling. So like I said, they they did a lot of basically like backstage stuff. And it was, I would say it's pretty well produced because there's, there's actually some good stuff there. So we get this like shot of Emily just clapping her hands, which fun fact, if you want to know if Allie is really pissed, she does the hand clapping thing too. <laughs> um, but Emily, I did understand what she was saying because she was hand clapping incorrectly. She's like, my life will be so much better without Brennan. <laughs> he better be deserving of me <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> she says that he's a two and she's a ten um and then this is the part where cameron says to brennan as he's walking in there's a granule of something true and then they just build around it to for things that support them um yeah. The thing I noticed was that Chloe wasn't even sitting with them in the dressing room. (laughs) I'm just like, is it that bad? But yeah. Later on, I got evidence that Chloe is friendly with at least Emily. We all did. Um, (laughs) It's like, I got evidence. (laughs) I think though, I, I think Chloe is truly probably one of the smartest people to ever come on the show in terms of how to actually do optics. Yeah. Um, Because I think, or even just how to take care of yourself. Look, if I'm sitting there having to record this show and talk about all this stuff, I don't want to be mired in the pink, like, brigade's toxicity all day. Yeah, because once you've been on a reality show, this is going to be like if if you did something prominent and every time someone Google searched you, that's going to come up. When you realize or look at it from the lens of this show is just going to be a little part of your life and not forever. This is just a phase in your life. Then you treat it accordingly. But you can't treat it. I'm not saying they're not allowed to feel their feelings. You can. But you have to remember that this too is going to be in your rear window. And I think that's how Chloe is treating it. Let me just get through this in the best way possible. They're all about optics. I think that's the funny part. They keep saying that about the guys, but as a human being, everyone has a level of concern about optics. So Chloe is in her own way and just handling it different. The women are in their own way because right now they're like, oh, we need to speak our own truth and stuff. It's just all about how you execute it. Um so claire is taking deep breath she's about to go do this one-on-one with cameron she says she's scared lauren is like gassing her up she tells the girls to pray for her and then they go out and claire and cameron sit on separate couches i'm i must say i didn't find it jarring i just thought it was just interesting how guys we've never had this before i mean chris and Paige sat next to each other (laughs) (laughs) Claire and Cameron can't sit on the same couch. I I think it's very juvenile, but okay. Everybody needs to be comfortable. So that's where, sorry, that's where the producers come in. Why are you accommodating that? I I just think like, I'm not coming if I have to sit next to him. Honestly, I don't think so because part of the confusion of the season and even during, um, during the regular season, they'll yell at them after pizza gate. Then at the end, I'm apologizing. I wish you well. And this is this. And this continues in the reunion. Like, I think they could have sat on a couch together. Agreed that they could have sat on a couch together. So they go back, they talk about the wedding night. They rehash this whole slender thing. The only sort of difference in this story or new thing is something about um, European slender. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly! Oh, like... I... She was of the opinion that I called her a small, a small, flat-butted lady. Mm, 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 mm. These two, I have <laughs> never seen two people so incompatible. The sky is blue. Oh my god! Did you just say that it was some kind of shade of blue? What do you mean? What are you trying to say? Do you think I can't tell the color of the sky? What? 
I are not on the same page at all. Not on the same page at all. Then Kevin whips out an after party clip, which I think is very revelatory for what exactly happened with Claire and Cameron. I still, I think Tane might even, one of us said this probably when we watched that episode of after party. There was some kind of miscommunication here about Cam being attracted to Claire. And I truly believe Claire thinks Cam wasn't attracted to her. And I actually believe that Cam was attracted to Claire. Probably didn't say it in the right way to where she understood mm-hmm. what he was saying. And mm-hmm. it completely screwed everything up. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's, again, another downfall of the season with her, with Becca. Once they have an assumption that this is how they interpret stuff, they take it as fact. Again, feelings are not facts, guys. And that's where, and Claire seems to be like an overthinker, overanalyzer, and she just took it and ran. I was like, he's not attracted to me. This man even said, I gave you compliments. And she said, but I didn't like your compliments. (laughs) Well, she said he (laughs) never gave her compliments. And then I was like, I could have sworn we saw him give her compliments. Like, am I crazy? But she was like, any random person could say this. This is, it was insane, aid. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I can't i can't believe it <laughs> then, and once again some other show was playing out because our next topic is did claire come and see cameron when he was sick and the answer is no but the reasons differ he says she would plan to come then she would cancel plan to come again and then she would cancel so eventually he stopped engaging with her planning she says that that didn't happen he's lying i don't care <laughs> oh my god the, but the story we were given on the show, the story we were given on the show is that Claire kept on trying to reach out and he was ignoring her. And the funny thing about the optics of it is it doesn't really matter. The whole time that she, I think for optics, was trying to act like she cared was for optics. And he didn't care about optics anymore because he wasn't on the show. So he's like, you don't need to come. <laughs> I don't want to see yeah. you. <sighs> And then her saying, you're trying to make me look bad, like I was trying to care for you, but you didn't give me the space to do that? You're not entitled to care for him, or am I wrong? I I wish he would have said, though, we were broken up and I didn't want you to care for me. Because I think that's the truth. Uh, Yes. And you're well within your right to say that. And the other thing about their segment that I wish they had shown more of was... Her rejection of him, her criticism of him. Oh, you're short. Oh, don't touch me. Oh, when he tried to put his arm over her and how she froze and looked uncomfortable. Like, there's some kind of revisionist history that's happening that we should have touched on. And her response is going to be, he told me on the second night he wasn't attracted to me. And everything she did was a response to that. Yeah, you're right. And interpreted through the lens of this man is not attracted to me. And we're having all these conversations about optics. He's just acting this way because he wants to look good. Good God. Exhausting. So then we watched the one month anniversary dinner where they said, okay, we're going to separate or divorce. They couldn't even agree on a word in their plotting and planning. (laughs) (laughs) Claire Claire says that it was planned because everything was planned. The divorce was real. Cam was saying, she kept on telling me that I, you have to do it. He didn't want to do it. It would be on him to follow the plan. Claire says there was confusions because there was two humans strategizing. I'm like, please get out of you. So Kevin says that I hear you. The whole thing was a deception. You were both part of the deception. And then he revisits his whole, you messing with this process only messed with yourselves. <laughs> So all the parts she was tearing up at the wedding, saying she misses him and all that, was that an act too? I don't know. Oh my God. This is where Cameron, I'm like, you might be an effing liar. Because he decides, because Kevin has to do this thing during the reunion where he tries to get people back together who should not be together. So his first targets are Cameron and Claire. Um, And Cameron decides to entertain this bullshit talking about Oh, well, serendipity brought us together. So maybe we're meant to be together. I'm with Claire because Claire is like, you basically called me a sociopath five minutes ago. What do you mean you want to get back together? (laughs) You say that this is where Cameron might be a liar. He is a liar. Like, honestly, I think they're all liars. (laughs) But he's so full of shit for saying that. Like, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? Stop. (laughs) 
And when Claire says that she feels, because Kevin asked her, do you feel like you're being manipulated? I was like, I'm with you, girl. It feels like he was trying to do one last ditch effort for the cameras to be like, see, she rejected me when I said I wanted to get back together. I'm in love with her, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it was bullshit. <laughs> hmm. It was. I'm still in love with her. When were you in love with her, Cameron? Come on. Kevin says something about moving forward. Uh, let's be friends, basically. Um, he asked what they've been up to. Claire says she's graduating next week. She's been working on school and she's seeing someone. Then Kevin tries to be like, well, why didn't you say you were seeing someone to justify <laughs> not wanting to do this? Him? And I'm like, she's not required to do that. <laughs> She's really not required to do that. Mm. All I want to know is what does Claire's boyfriend look like? Listen, <laughs> you guys, if, if anybody gets a hint or a picture, but if you do, drop it. Drop it into DMs. That's all I want to see. <laughs> Claire and Cameron wish each other well. Um, and they end this torture for all of us. And, and then, then Hallelujah. <laughs> Then we're back to this backstage cameras and audio. Um, and Cameron is telling Brennan, they just have so much confidence to say whatever the fuck they want to say. And Claire <laughs> is making the good point with the girls. If I'm so terrible, why does he want to get back with me? <laughs> Before they go backstage, Cameron reminds us why he's annoying. He always wants to get his lick back or get a passive aggressive dig in because the, when he was saying the niceties, he's like, oh, I just want to say something that isn't manipulative, that isn't whatever, because they're going to say like, I'm lying. I'm like, Cameron, just say what you have to say without all of that. But uh, Incapable. these should never be in contact. They shouldn't be in contact with each other. <laughs> So next up for the torture den is Becca and Austin. Oh, goodness. So Kevin's like, what happened? What was real and what wasn't? And Becca's like, well, I just can't tell. It's hard to differentiate. And Kevin once again asked the, the, um, the pact. And she's like, well, I think either Becca or, or um, Austin said something to the effect of the pact was the two of us Versus everyone else, Becca not like the whole group, I guess. And then but it fell apart when Austin started lying to her. And the interesting thing is I'm like, Becca seems way more pissed at Austin than she was at that final group happy hour when she was crying on Emily's so shoulder about how she missed this man. And it has been many, many months. I think at this point it's probably been what, like at least six months. So she's allowed to have a change. I just, mm -hmm. the contrast is interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know what they say about reality TV when you have to rewatch stuff that you thought you had made peace with and it reignites all the feelings all over again. And that, I wonder if this is the first time they're seeing each other. I, you know, also, I wish we'd had more clarity on that. Yeah. So we see them at one month because Kevin's like, you guys seemed really great. Um, so we see them at their one month anniversary being absolutely adorable that day they went skating. Um, and then, I'm sorry. Can I say that Kevin said that they looked really cute, but Austin looked terrified in that clip. <laughs> <laughs> because she was like, hi, you really like you. He's like, oh, yay, married. I'm like, oh, in hindsight, this doesn't look so cute. <laughs> you know what? I will give you that in hindsight. You, can... <laughs> you have to read between the lines because... <laughs> Becca says, I hate you. <laughs> and he says, I love liking you. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> this is hilarious. And then, okay, so this was odd because Kevin was like, so was that real? And Becca's <laughs> like, well, it kind of was, but I protected Austin by not talking about the argument that happened in the car afterwards. Mm hmm And I was like, but that's not what the man asked. But it then goes into this whole thing about how she Austin wasn't at oh, his best no. and it just took a lot to get him to talk or, or to film or to emote properly for filming. So Kevin asked Austin, did it feel lovey or did you have to get pushed into being loving? And Austin is like, I don't want to act like it, it wasn't me that he respected what she said and how she remembers it. But that like all the days of filming were a lot and the time and the energy 
um, like with your life and your work and your job, it's exhausting. So Kevin agrees that it's exhausting, but he's like, but you're supposed to be documenting what you're going through. So we're basically he's pushing on like, were things different off camera? Um, mm-hmm. Then they go into their intimacy talk. He's like, she's like, oh, on camera, we talked about progressing intimacy, but then it didn't match. And then at one point she started to see that she was living in a fantasy, which I agree with her. She was living in a fantasy and it wasn't one I think of her own making. I, I think Austin very much participated in not being as straight with her as he could have been. Agreed. Austin claims that he wasn't avoiding intimacy, but the sexual connection was not happening at the same rate for him as it was for her. Kevin says it never happened. (laughs) And Austin (laughs) says, we acknowledge that it was an issue. We were working on it. And this is the part where I still have sympathy for Austin in that he's like, the pressure was not helping. Yeah. Whatever was going to happen, the talking and the therapy, and the, it, it just wasn't helping. Becca's defense of that is that it wasn't the sexual intercourse. And then she says she heard at an after party that he had a six-month rule. This is where, th- I'm sorry, some of this like squad stuff really gets revealed. They play back the clip. Becca heard from Emily that Austin said he had a six-month rule. If mm-hmm. you listen to the clip, Austin never said that. He said three to six months was typical. And then Emily starts getting on him. Like, did you tell Becca that? This is also where Austin is a little fuzzy because he's not firm about his answer in after party. Like, yes, I told her normal for me is three to six months. Because he's like, I I thought we were on the same page, which is a really good cop out for when you're not direct with someone. Yeah. But Austin never speaks with confidence. So it automatically automatically seems like he's lying. Because I'm like, he speaks like measured already and then he doesn't speak with confidence and ultimately it's like so did you or did you not and then he's still like oh i don't know maybe i didn't i apologize and then you're just like Ugh. but if he truly didn't tell her that is a huge thing to skip out on especially since becca says she kept asking him to give her a timeline i don't think he ever told her and i don't think he really has a three to six month rule <laughs> This man was just not, I don't, I think even if he just said, I felt unsure about us and I don't want to have sex until this just became bigger than it should have been, honestly, because it shouldn't be this complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So Rebecca relates two stories about how she would be looking for, it wasn't just sex. It was emotional intimacy and sort of how he was deflecting her. So she said that they were hugging fully clothed in the kitchen, just having a good time. And he pushed her off and he said, get off me, you horny girl. And I'm like, if your relationship wasn't where it was at that moment, I think you would have taken that for the joke that it is. But it's one of those jokes that like hits a little too close to the surface. What I would love to have asked her, what do you think his intention was with that? Yeah. This is just like the jacket thing when they went pottery. The joke itself is not that bad, but wrong timing, wrong audience, sensitive spot. Maybe don't say it. You know? But yeah, on its own, it's it's harmless. And then the second one was that she'd be like, we could just, after the hot tub, I would suggest that we just like shower with our bathing suits on. Again, not sex. And he was like, no. Um... (laughs) They disagree about whether they had emotional intimacy. He thought that they did. She's like, no, we didn't. He goes into a list of all the things they did that he considered intimacy. He's like, we kissed and we made out and we hugged. And there are other things that happen in the bedroom. And he said it takes him a while for him to give himself to another person that way. And that they were getting to that. And then they got slammed with a wedge between them. So Kevin asked, what was the wedge? What was the wedge, you ask? And... He says, like, the wedge was the barrage of just being like, why aren't you being more sexual? Why isn't this happening? And Becca was like, "Mm, well, to me, the wedge was when you went out with the producer and lied about it. So to be fair to Austin, I think they hit a wedge long before the producer thing. So I'm not sure. That raised another question for me. 
When was the first time that Austin went out with a producer? Like, they skimmed through the entire producer thing. So this is part of the reasons where I'm like, this was unfulfilling. Because what is the point? I get it. You have to protect your producer, I guess. But I just... I, I, I don't know what to do with this. This is pointless. Like, why even bring up the producer if we're not going to delve into it? Because the next question would be, what is it about the producer that made you uncomfortable? But that didn't come up. But when she said that, though, Austin just says, he has nothing to say. He just says, fair. And that's it. Where do you go from there when someone admits to it? <laughs> so... Kevin says there was a producer interjecting in your relationship. What was it about it that, you know, annoyed you? Becca says she didn't know about them going out and he she wasn't invited. And on top of that, they lied to her about it. The f- next question should have been, what do you mean? Who's they? What happened? But they didn't ask that. And because that means I, I took it as she meant like the producer also lied to her. Right? Yes. But uh, we didn't do that. So he asked Austin, why wasn't she invited? He says, well, you know, it was right after decision day and there was no let's go and celebrate, which was stupid. It is stupid. How can you have decision day? You both said yes and you weren't with your wife. We've talked about this before, but I don't know. There's so many signs that I don't think he wanted to be with her, but I don't know why he's not saying it. Um, This is one of the worst segments because they say the producer... They didn't say the producer drove a wedge. They said him going out with the producer drove the wedge. The wedge was not driven on decision day. It was way before that. So I don't understand when did he start hanging out with the producer? And I don't understand why they didn't explore that further. Yeah, because yeah, to, to your point, when you say when he went out with the producer, no, he said when he went out with the producer and lied about it. So it has to be that pizza party night. Even but if they I went mean, out, that's not mathing. That is not mathing. Yeah, that's what I said. I was like, I don't. I think there was a wedge before that, so I don't know why she thinks that's the wedge of why they weren't being sexual because that was at the end of the experiment. So, like everything else in the season, like you said, the mathing, mathing. So, Becca says, and then you lied, and then he says, "Well, I've acknowledged and that I've made a mistake many times," and then they move on. Kevin says that, you know, when he watched it, it comes off like Austin is watching her suffering. (laughs) He said, I'm sorry to hear I made you suffer. Honestly, that really irritated me. I think I'm just tired of Austin apologizing. Because he just wants to be done with this and move on. And I don't know if he's actually sorry or if he's just tired of the whole situation. He's definitely tired of the whole situation. I also read a comment that was like, that producer, whoever he's been hanging out with, probably gave him lots of advice about how to <laughs> deal with this and come off looking as best as he possibly can. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, uh, I had this question and I forgot um, earlier. It's a little crass, but the internet is talking about Austin being very um, shy or concerned about optics, but that he mentioned something about asking Becker to peg him. Do you have any recollection of this? No, none. I'm trying to see if this actually happened. Yeah, if it was, if it's a joke they're just making fun of, or if this actually happened, because I'm like, this is not in my memory bank at all in one of their intimacy exercises, maybe, but okay. Oh, no, I think I remember now. It was the diorama. Remember the sexual dioramas? No. Oh, okay. The terrarium, sorry, I called them dioramas. They were the plants. Oh, yes. Yes. I think yes. that's when he made a joke about it then. Oh, okay. <sighs> I don't know. Um, okay. I was just wondering about it. I was like, what? I do not recall this. Okay, so um Becca says that it was always his plan to get through this, say yes on decision day, and then figure it out after. Austin said, mm, no. What I said was that I wanted to get remarried and have another wedding after this was done. And I'm like, these are two different things, but okay. (laughs) One has nothing to do with the other. (laughs) I'm not seeing anything nefarious with someone saying, I like you. I just want to get to decision day and get this over with so we can start living our real lives. 
Like, I don't see it as a negative that someone would say, I'm saying yes on decision day because I like you that much, even though I don't enjoy this process. It's a little ignorant to think like, oh, we'll just go through with all of our dysfunction and then say yes on decision day. But I don't see it as like an evil thing that he was trying to do. I agree with you, but I can't even back Austin on this because he said, no, I didn't say that. (laughs) So I don't know what's true. So Austin says, well, what a shitty note to end this on. Like, I didn't think this is where we would be. And Becca says, it's okay. We were not for each other. And he has a lot of growing to do. I don't disagree. And he wasn't ready for someone like her. She said that she realized that, you know, it wasn't going to work because she was never going to be a priority for him. Kevin asks, if he had made you a priority, would you be together? And she says something about him not making her a priority at all. I was like, that's not what he asked. And Austin was like, well, I wanted us to work, but I just didn't do a good job of that. Kevin asks if she's seeing anyone. She says she's not seeing anyone. Austin says he's going to date, but he has moved on from the whole thing. But he does want to move to a place where they're in a good space. Becca was like, mm, I don't trust him. And it might take her like two to three years <laughs> or something like that to get there. Maybe then, but no. But my takeaway from their gender wars is actually like, I do think that I know they always said that she's so sensitive or whatever, but Becca does have a leg to stand on with Austin. No matter how many ways he tries to twist it, Austin did lead Becca on. Um, I do think like some things were misconstrued and, you know, interpreted in different ways, but he was never really clear. I don't think it's too much for her to expect to be desired by her husband. I don't think it's too long to be clear To expect him to be clear and say like, hey, this is too much pressure. Let's take this off the table. I mean, Dr. Pia tried to tell him all the time, but he just kept saying, let's work on it. We're going to have sex on Friday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. So I don't know. Of course, when you don't have answers, you're going to make things up. So I think Becca um, actually had a leg to stand on in this whole whatever is going on. So Kevin says... Thank you, guys. It's unfortunate that we weren't able to get to the bottom of this. Again, this is the second couple where we were not able to get to the bottom of anything. And Austin is like, "Um, when you say that, it sounds like you're questioning my honesty, and that's offensive. And Becca's like, well, you haven't been honest. And then Kevin, (laughs) Kevin says, well, hold up. I know you think that I just have a bunch of cards and... You know, I'm just saying things, but I am part of this process and I hear what is happening. So when I ask you questions, it's an opportunity for you to put things on the table and respond to it. But if you don't want to, it's cool. And I'm like, no, it's not cool because we don't know. Because what Kevin essentially is saying is that the producers know stuff. They told Kevin stuff. And that's what's created the questions and they're giving him an opportunity to address these things or bring it up. And they're also giving him the option not to talk about it. Why? <laughs> I, now I'm offended. <laughs> I what did you Kevin, think about that? Um, I, You know what? I'm glad you explained that because I didn't really understand what Kevin was saying. Oh, um, okay. I did not read between those lines. I thought Kevin was just saying, I'm not just here reading cards. I actually know what's going on. Um, And I'm asking you questions so that you can address what's going on. No one's like Mm -hmm. out to get you. But I thought it was interesting that I felt like Kevin spent way less time trying to get those two back together than he did Cameron and Claire. I was like, so why are these people exempt from the, is there hope there? Is there a vision there? Is there something we can try again? Well, because at least, um, even though they're lying, Cameron was like, I was attracted to you. And Claire was like, oh, I was attracted to you. But these two, whether or not they say that they were, it was obvious that something was missing there. So there's no point. So backstage, Austin and Becca hug. And Becca tells the ladies that, oh, that we just hugged. And that he thanked me that I could have gone harder on him. And he was crying. And I'm like, you know, this is this scene is the epitome of the season because all we saw was a hug and it seemed like they were nice. 
why didn't we see the whole, you could have gone harder on me, thank you for not saying all the things you could have said. Like, it's almost like the producers are in on the pact with them. And mm-hmm. that's confused. But anyways, Claire, because Claire always has to say something. She's like, oh, I think when he's around you, like you question yourself and I see that in you and I don't want that, but he's a good guy. And I'm like, eh. anyways, that was that (laughs) with them. I found the one-on-one conversations to be much more productive than the idiotic group conversations. Mm. Yeah, because everyone's trying to get their point across in the group. So we move on to Chloe and Michael, who at least sit side by side. Kevin just goes straight to it and is like, what happened? Chloe said, listen, she went in. Nothing was going to deter her from saying yes on decision day. Like it was the hardest thing she has ever done, but she was going to give everything in her to this experiment. Kevin asks, you know, about Chloe going home after the couple's retreat. And Michael said he just wanted to support her. Kevin said, Chloe, if Michael had said, don't go, I need you to stay, would you have stayed? Um, This is a part where when Kevin is saying that he hears things and he knows what happened, I think Chloe told a producer what she really felt. And those are the kind of things that they're feeding to Kevin, because that was a very specific question that Kevin asked. So she said, full transparency, she would have stayed. And in fact, it's what she needed to hear. Now, watching this and when she said that, my first thought was like, I think that's unfair to Michael. Yeah, because no one can read your mind. You have to say what you feel, especially after a couple days that you've been married. He, he is not in a position to, to read your moods and read your mind. Also, there was a whole thing that we watched where she told him that I'm overwhelmed. I'm such an introvert. I'm the kind of person that needs space and I need to just decompress. We're going through a lot. We're doing through things. And he just thought that he was supporting her in what she said. And now I'm beginning to think like, did she feel that was what she needed to hear in hindsight? Or did she really feel that in that moment? Because If you needed him to say that, why did you even have the urge to leave? Like, is it a test? I'm not a fan of people testing people in relationships. I just think it's unnecessary. I don't think it was a test, but earlier Chloe had said something to the effect of like, he just says like the most perfect thing that I need to hear. So I felt like he had sort of lived up to something up until that point. And then when he didn't say the perfect thing that she needed to hear, then he wasn't actually live like he... He was deviating from sort of the pattern that she thought they'd already built. Hmm. Okay. So she continues by saying that she said that she didn't feel like he was invested in the marriage and he had his own reasons for coming into the show. I don't know what that Mm -mm. means. But she said, and then Kevin is like, okay, what do you mean? And here's the thing. We got answers with these people. Well, not with Michael. But with Chloe, let me let me be clear about that. She said, you know, they had just gotten married. They were in the car to be taken to the hotel. And she turns to him and she's like, oh, what's my new last name? And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. There won't be any reason to change your name. And she's all like, okay, maybe he's progressive and I don't need to change my name and all that. Then the second thing was finding out that his mom didn't know about the marriage. She said she understood cultural differences and, you know, sorting out the first trauma of the person who left him at the altar. But if you are fully committed, why wouldn't you just tell your mom that why is she the one stepping outside of her comfort zone? And it didn't feel like it was being reciprocated. Michael steps in and he's like, hey, I don't remember the whole last name scenario the same way. I think I might have said it jokingly and it was in passing. And regarding the mom thing, it's not that he didn't tell his family. He just didn't tell his mom. And again, this is a thing where I was like, is this a hindsight thing? Because all through after party, the season, the experts, she said, I support him. He doesn't have to tell. I know where he's coming from, and I'm fine with that. And maybe this is why Dr. Pia was like, cut the bullshit. (laughs) Uh, Chloe is, I wish we could ask Chloe about her change of stance. Because how do you go from, I support him to, this is one of the reasons. Well, 
The other part is that Chloe said yes on decision day. And she's now been left trying to figure out why did Michael say no. So this sounds like a theory of why Michael said no when you don't have any other information to go off of. Not an expression about how she was actually feeling in the moment. Yes, because she did say, I I think she did mention that these feelings came in hindsight. And I think that Chloe said, we've talked about it. She knew he was going to say no. Chloe said yes to stick it to Michael. (laughs) Like, I'm going to show you how committed I am. I'm saying yes. But she knew he was going to say no um, on decision day. Um, But the thing I took out of it was like, this scenario could easily could have had her on the pink lady's point of view where you could be like, you plotted, you planned, you strategized and you tried to do this and you were being nefarious, but she just, you know, chose not to go that route, you know, cause she has every right to do it to him. So Kevin asked him, what is the thing that changed your mind? He was like, his doubt crept up a little before the one month time frame. And then Kevin's like, you're still not saying like what the reason is. And Chloe is like, just speak. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Like, just say it. So he says like he didn't really like have like a list. Like it's not because of her. Kevin says, okay, is it that you don't want to be married? Because I know married people that don't want to be married. <laughs> Kevin is just <laughs> that's so I want to be married. And he's like, no, like he just didn't think that they, he just didn't feel like they built a strong foundation. And Chloe said, well, that's where I think we were different. He came in committed enough for the process, like to get through the process, but not 100%. And then Kevin is like, you guys seem so perfect. Like, you know, what happened? My, he says, Michael says a lot of things. He says he regrets saying no. He wished he felt more comfortable saying yes. Kevin is like, do you wish you had a second chance? Chloe, full, she's like, nope. What is, she said all the things she's been saying all season. What is meant to be she will not pass or something like that. I'm not saying it right. And she says she's not dating anyone. She has not met anyone. But she knows that her next relationship will be the soulmate her heart has been calling out for. Michael says that he's not dating someone, he's grown, Chloe has taught him to be more empathetic, and this is the third couple that we have where we also don't have any answers. But honestly, my deduction of this, Michael was not ready to be married. The two, Chloe is silent, but he's not going to tell us what the reason is. That's my conclusion. Hmm... I mean, 99% of the time when it doesn't work out on Married at First Sight, I I really truly believe that, yeah, there are a few people who are not ready to be married to anyone, but you will make yourself ready for the right person. Yes. I I, I think a lot of it is exactly what you said. I'm not ready to be married to this person. Yes. And and, and that line that Chloe threw out where he was in it for his own reasons... And, you know, Michael does seem kind of like a showman. But, again, we always say that Maps is the wrong place to come for. I don't know. It's just, like, because he was dumped at the altar. He was saying all the things. He said he had done all the work. It's just really hard to suddenly see that pivot into, oh, I'm not ready to get married. So, oh, well. I honestly wish that they would have brought out his first bride because that would have really created some fireworks for this reunion. Girl, at this point, that girl is at the altar on her knees, thanking God for saving her from this dumpster fire of the season. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. All right, we're going to take a little break and come back where Kevin talks with the ladies. All right, and we're back. So all the ladies come out. They all sit together. And Kevin asks, what's up with the beef with uh, the men? And Becca was like, you know, the men just weren't ready for the process. And Lauren was like, it's just about, it's not really like beef. It's just like not giving her power away. Emily says like, you know, it's not anger. It's just, there's also sadness in there. And Claire says like, they just were not living in their truth. And they're just trying to live in their truth now. And Chloe says nothing. 
she just does that little <laughs> nodding and swaying that she does <laughs> when they're there. So Kevin asks, like, why did they decide to drop the system? And Emily says, you know, it's just their maturity levels, not them, the men, of course, that it's their maturity levels, that they're not as mature. And Kevin says, you guys say it all the time, and it's strong women. Why didn't you just say no? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I don't want it to feel like you're shaming people, but it's true. They tell us every 50 seconds like and they are strong women actually these women are intelligent i'm not even gonna say like it's not that so it's just hard it's just confusing let me just put it that way so claire just says oh that's a complicated question like they just said they were going to protect the marriage for her and she didn't want people to see cameron the way she did (laughs) and lauren says like for her, like, or for them, the goal was never marriage. And honestly, they just got a bad batch of men. And Kevin pushed back. And he's like, well, I mean, we can't just, like, I'm not, I can't just, you know, just throw it all on them. And Lauren was like, well, yeah, they went with the flow and it wasn't all the men. And then Kevin mentions the no sex throughout the season. He did say, except for Chloe and Michael, because I really was going to be like, hello, Chloe and Michael. But Lauren was like, yeah, it was like the Sahara Desert up in here. And Becca says, yeah, that she hates to say it, but it just feels like there was some conspiring. And then they played the unseen footage, which I thought we did see when they all met up afterwards, of her saying how it is weird that all the men were like we're not gonna have sex with our wives and she's tempted to ask them for their phones to see their group chat (laughs) Chloe said that it was just surprising to her that she just assumed that everyone had had sex that it's unbelievable to her to proceed forward in the marriage without having consummated it so she just thought everyone had and I was like, well, if they were, they wouldn't be this angry. Like, maybe there'll be less contention, but yeah. So um, he asked Emily, like, after the accident, that if she actually thought that it would work with um, Brennan. And Claire spoke up before Emily did. Like, why does Claire have this compulsive need to speak? She's like, he didn't treat her well. But then Emily gets emotional and says that she was just really vulnerable and him... Um, acting really nice to her, that everything was just a mindfuck for her, and she hates to say it, but he used her accident to come out on top. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, Claire is, like, straddling the chair to comfort Emily and is holding her and sitting in between the the chair hands. So, Emily is, already, is crying at this point, and she's like, you know, she had a broken wrist, her hair extensions got in there, and the universe was really just telling her to get away from this guy, and she just wanted to catch a break. And then Kevin was like, well, thank you guys for coming out, and Emily's like, wow, we didn't cover a lot. And I'm like, <laughs> I was well, like, you know what? I appreciate it when people come to the reunion, and they're like, I know what I want to talk about. Um, on one hand, I was like, Emily doesn't know that we have barely even begun this reunion. Like, I, you, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. I mean, she was right. Cause I was like, wait, we're done. What was the point? And then he said, what is it that you want to cover? And she says, well, I just want to cover the whole Brennan and Cameron thing. And then she says like, he was texting Claire's friend. He was texting this person. And Kevin is like, oh, don't worry. We are going to cover that, but we're going to cover it with them all here and all that. So she's like, oh, okay. And then on their backstage and Austin is like, the girls are still experiencing hurt. And Brennan is like, yeah, they're just looking for someone to blame. And then we see the evidence that Aid was talking about earlier. They're in the hallway and Chloe's talking to Emily. And I don't know, that makes me feel better because I just don't know if... (laughs) They were icing her out, or she's just like, I'm too grown for this shit. I don't know which it is, but I just want everybody to get along. But she's telling Emily, like, you know, speak your truth, but not in a combative way. In 0.5 seconds, we're going to find out that Emily did not take that advice. I like the idea that Chloe is like, guys, I love you, but I'm not in this. My man (laughs) is not terrible. Um, I'm not going to go out there and say that he is. So in the interest of me loving you, but not really wanting to be part of this. I'm not going to wear a pink dress. 
I'm not going to do this whole like league of extraordinary woman thing with you. Like, but I will say, I will give you supportive words before you go out there. And I do, yes. I mean, Chloe is the, the only one who's, who is calm, who is making lots of sense. I yeah. wish that she could have infused some of this, like, I'm sort of above it all into Emily, but that really didn't happen. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. But in some way, would you say that Becca was kind of reasonable? But uh, you know what? I will give Becca that she was very reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, Orion is with the men just yada yada talking about it's so tough holding composure. I really dislike Orion. I need to. <laughs> you know what? I can't criticize this women for being so mad at them when I didn't even meet the man and I'm so annoyed by it. <laughs> so we see Emily walking out behind Brennan, giving him two middle fingers. He offers her water. She goes, No, thank you. So Brennan and Emily are the next couple out there. And he asks what happened. Brennan says, ultimately, they were in a match. They had different lifestyle. And when he felt that the experts didn't match him correctly, he started to not trust the process. Emily's already ranting like, oh, did you trust the process? Did you try? He's like, you are who you are, but you are not for me. Emily says, well, he avoided everything by deflecting. And if she said something wrong, he punished her. If she did something right, then he was there. And he's like, how did I do that? He was like, well, if I said something you didn't want me to say, you would leave. If I said something that was right, then maybe you would do lunch with me, which is horrible if it's true. That's terrible. I will say this. As she was saying this, I just believed every word of it. Yes. It's it is so consistent with who Brennan is. I agreed. Agreed. Um, they do a montage of the experts visit and Emily is very excited about this. And they specifically played the Dr. Pia one where she's like, I'm talking, I am talking. <laughs> and Kevin, <laughs> Kevin asks, like, why were you so concerned? He was like, I was concerned about how it would make her feel. Emily says, Nope, you were concerned about how it would make you feel. Then he says that like, he apologized, that he didn't express himself in a way that was conducive to a lot of words to their relationship. And she said, I don't give a fuck about a number of things, but you were protecting yourself, not me. Then he's saying, when he apologizes again, she asks, like, do you know what you did? Do you know how you treated me wrong? Do you know how you manipulated me? And Brennan is like, it's so hard to believe that you think I'm a bad person because when Pastor Cal came over and he said to list over 10 things, to list things that you liked about me, you listed over 10 things. I'm like, oh my God, we are in the schoolyard. He said, the thing that tore them apart was a malicious rumor. And Kevin is like, what rumor is that? He's like, about the double date. And then Emily's like, the rumors. This is where Salt Lake could have come in, the rumors. But Kevin is like, okay, wait. Brennan is saying rumor, and you're saying rumors. What are they? And then we end the episode in a cliffhanger. And I honestly, I'm glad we got a break because uh, whew, I needed to rehydrate. <laughs> I... I, this is, I started thinking, so when exactly did they decide that they were going to let everybody know about Emily's cheating? Because they did still do some after party taping after this reunion. And I, I now I'm like, something, something about the reunion was where they were like, gloves are coming off. Oh, yeah, because it's the last time they've been going at it in like social media. But I do think that there's been like a talk because there's been some chill. In the last few weeks, I think they're just like, I'm over it. We're not doing any of that. But the reunion is where, well, like Claire said, they want to live in their truth and get everything off their chest. But it still feels controlled. Like we're not getting the whole thing. I think the Emily cheating is like so... Scandalous sounds like the wrong word. But it's just such an interesting tidbit of information that's... So either so many people don't know or so many people are holding on to. If they don't mention it on the reunion, that's going to be a huge flaw of the season. And why you should not shoot the reunion before you're done shooting after party. I can't believe the fact that they shot this reunion in December is actually crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. They 
need to learn a lot of lessons from this season. But I feel like I said that about Nashville. And uh, I don't know, with the way that we're factory producing, I don't know if they learned from it, but they can't repeat this. I don't know. Why am I saying that? We're still watching, but, you know. The inmates are running the asylum. (laughs) That is so funny to me. (laughs) That's all I have to say about that. (laughs) I truly feel like the producers lost control of this show. And now they're just having to work around the cast instead of the cast, you know, living their lives and the producers and editors figuring out what to show. How do you solve this problem? How do you solve for this problem? I don't know. You know how you solve for this problem, though? These people can't get in league for each other unless you force them to hang out. None, you know, none of this was happening when no one was, was hanging out together. I think it's more layered than that. I think there's the hanging out part, but then there's the new generation of reality shows where there are people who are not as committed. They're just here for a good time. And if they happen to fall in love, then that's nice. But the previous people are just like, my goal is to fall in love and to give it all I got. And how do you solve for that? You cannot tell intentions, I think. But again, you can't. (laughs) <laughs> this is why I want to watch the matchmaking special because if they're intentionally leaning hard into the drama or the thing, they need to scale back on that. I will say this. I have never believed that they're leaning hard into drama. I have always believed that they really want to find people who want to be married. I think they want to create successful couples. And I don't think there was anything on the face of any of the people who came on the show that would lead us to where we are now. I want to believe that, but I remember we watched the matchmaking special. I don't know how Chris made it. I don't know. I'm sorry. You had a whole bunch of people and you made Chris, but no, I didn't watch this one, but I want to know how Brennan made it. Like I didn't, I don't know. I just feel like you can smell, especially if they're like, experts, producers, whatever. You can smell authenticity. Like, what about... Well, I can see how Austin made it. But there's something about Austin that that... Like, he doesn't sound confident. I wouldn't want that on a show. So it's just interesting to me. That's what I want to know is, like, where, how... Who are the people... Like, the same way Chloe didn't make the first cut. Like, who are the people that are being skipped for in favor of these people and what gives them the edge? You know, so we'll never know, but it's nice speculating, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, guys, that is the um, episode. Don't forget that uh, we will cover episode two, but it will be a little late. And next week we would have Love is Blind in replacement for a new episode. So you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Alter Call MAFS. That's A-L-T-A-R-C-A-L-L-M-A-F-S. We love hearing from you guys on the socials. Please tell us your thoughts about part one of this reunion. And subscribe so you don't miss any new episode that drops. Please give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And we will see you in two weeks. And don't forget to check out our Patreon for bonus episodes. Bye, guys. Bye.